What's up everybody? My name is Chris Jones. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. And the first person I want to see when I got to Toronto was Dr. Vibe. Been on his show before. I will be on his show again if he lets me. He's a great guy. I tell everyone to tune in, to download, to subscribe. You're gonna learn some things. It's good for your mind, it's good for your heart, it's good for your body, it's good for your spirit. On and off the mic, he's a great guy. You gotta check him out. My name's Chris Jones, all from Chicago. Peace and love. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles and a solution for someone's problem. And as always, we're always happy to get our guest on the conversation piece, Dr. Charles Corpru III. Dr. Charles, how are you? I'm good, Doc. How are you doing? I am blessed, magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. Another converse. Looking forward to another conversation with us tonight. Uh, can you share with our audience because I know we have at least one brand new person. A little bit about yourself. Um, so uh, I am the president of WI Revolution Consulting, which is a consulting firm that uh, works with organizations in solving problems from a systems perspective with an equity lens. Uh, I have a PhD in psychological science from Tulane. I'm a former professor of psychological science at Loyola, where my work uh, has was focused and still uh, focuses on hypermasculinity um, in men. Uh, and so how that impacts everyone, not just men, and but as you say, men and the people who love us <laughs> you got it you got it well for, for for those who don't know for we're just continuing on a journey i don't know if we're, are we still doing the h2h or is it a different thing no, now H2H is all it, it, it always is that you know that road from hyper masculinity to healthy masculinity and even tonight's conversation you know uh, sex love or domination you know, we couch the conversation around what does that look like, you know, as you progress down that road from hypermasculinity to healthy masculinity. Excellent. Well, you mentioned our topic of conversation tonight, and I'd like to say what we are chatting about tonight is having a conversation about sex and hypermasculinity or domination. Why did you want to talk about this conversation tonight? Um, well, interesting, that in our last uh, conversation, we went back and looked at where the show had been over the last year and then where we wanted to go. And that was one of the conversations that came up. And then in conversation with you, we did we read an article of how hypermasculinity was impacting black males sexually. Uh, and so I thought it was a good time. Um, you know, we easily could talk post-election, but... Why not talk about sex, Doc, uh, and its impact on those around us to get us, you know, to get us out of that conversation around Donald Trump and what's going to happen to America uh, post Barack Obama? Well, it, it's interesting. We're not going to talk about the election. I've I've done a number of conversations about it, but indirectly, this conversation piece does relate a little bit to Donald Trump and his. Uh, alleged past. Let's put it that way. Say that one more time, Doc. For me. I, I'm just saying that we're not going to be talking about the election, which I understand. I've I've had a number of conversations about it, but this topic, even indirectly, has association with Donald Trump and some of his alleged behavior. Yeah, it, it does, and I think that you know, if we saw the actions or uh, actions on the campaign. Uh, my perceptions of his uh, his attitudes towards women, and then the you know the tape of him and Billy Bush uh, with the grab them in the pee comment uh, really is uh, it, to me indicative of that uh, uh, dimension of hypermasculinity that we we talk about callous sexual attitudes towards women, and. Um, I guess what was really, really interesting to me, and I, I'm still trying to unpack this with my friends and uh, with people, is um, 
a matter of privilege, a matter of male privilege, a matter of white male privilege, um, that if our president, our beloved president, Barack Obama, had made those similar comments, would he have even made it through the primaries? If that tape had came out, he would have been destroyed. Um, and so, but to have attitudes, you know, that that then lead to behaviors that are disruptive and distractive and uh, disrespectful of women um, are very interesting to me. Um, we aren't perfect people. And so, um, but most of us are not running for the highest office in our country. And so I think that we have these expectations for how men should comport themselves um, in this. Um, there doesn't seem to be any remorse. I think I would, I would have been a little bit more open to hearing the story, but there was no remorse on his part. Like, I'm sorry, like, um, you know, this is who I am. Uh, and so, but then on the flip side of that doc was to see um, that 53% of women educated or non -ed college educated women voted for him. Uh, that was, that is still a shocking statistic to me. Um, and so yeah. uh, the, yeah. quest, the question that I'm asking in my mind is that do women, did women just hate Hillary more than they hated to have a misogynistic man in the White House? And so I am, I am struggling and grappling with that, that fact um, to see women to, you know, because my president, our president here in, in the United States, our current president could not have said those things and been elected. It would, uh, whoever he was running against, they would have won in a landslide just for that one comment if it came out. Um, and so I'm, I'm grappling with why so many women, um, I mean, when you think of 53% of women, that's millions and millions, I mean, 60 million people voted for Donald Trump. And you, we typically are 50, 50 men, uh, men and women, but as it gets, as we get older, that changes a little bit. But you're thinking about over you know, possibly 30 million women voting for Donald Trump. That's a lot of people. And so, um, and I've had conversations with women who say, you know, I, uh, I just couldn't vote for her. Um, I just couldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And um, so it was just very interesting as we grapple with uh, misogynistic and hypermasculine behavior. Um, and then now we, we look at someone who is going to be our standard bearer for our country. So I couldn't say those things. Ahmed couldn't say those things. You couldn't say those things and expect people to follow you. True. True. Welcome, well, Ahmed. How are you? I'm blessed, I'm highly, blessed favorite, highly favorite. A magnet for miracles and a solution to someone's problems. And you're also king of echo right now. <laughs> oh no. The king of echo. Is that better? I know. Okay, so I think, I think we're okay now. Yeah. No, I'm still hearing a bit of echo somewhere. Okay. That's gone. Oh no. I I speak too soon. How about now? I think, yes, we're good now. Okay. Well, I, okay, we'll, we'll work with it. We'll work with it, as we say. We'll work with it. No problem. So, Ahmed, thanks very much for joining the conversation. Um, our conversation topic tonight is sex and hypermasculinity, love or domination. When you hear that topic, what comes to your mind first? That's pretty wild to start off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we gonna have some fun tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's that's wild. Uh, uh. Mm. Okay, you want me to fill in for you so you can sort of get a thought process wrapped around? Yeah. yeah it was like, mm, I didn't really see the advertisements for the show today, but <laughs> okay, so, okay, so okay, let, let me ask something. Uh, Dr. Charles, let me ask, the whole relationship between sex and hypermasculinity from a, a male perspective, do you feel that the areas 
this subject has got better handled over the years for men or not? I don't know if it's talked about a lot, Doc. You know, when you think about sex and hypermasculinity, um, you know, um, there are more open conversations about sex um, and sexual behavior. But, you know, quantifying. Um, let me take that back, Doc. I, I think that we when we think about sex and hypermasculinity, we think about um, sexual assault, domestic violence, um, things like that. So we have those conversations. But those are to me, like at the extreme of this. And so we think about, and that's why I said, is hypermasculinity, uh, love or domination, is there somewhere along the continuum of hypermasculinity that they're um, between love and domination? So, you know, uh, the, the, those callous sexual attitudes towards women. But the question that we be asked do some women like the hypermasculine men within the sexual sphere? You know, and that may be their uh, their perceptions or preferences for love within the bedroom. You know, and so men will take on that callous sexual attitude or that 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 dominance or hypermasculine persona in the bedroom, and it may be seen, you know, as loving and caring, and this is what I want. And so, I think that's why I think it becomes a very interesting topic because love or domination could it be both? So really interesting to have have that unpacked tonight. <laughs> I, I've often wondered um, what came first, the chicken or the egg, as it relates to your comment, Dr. Charles, because um, I'm wondering if some of the hypermasculinity came from the sexual trauma that women have experienced generationally, and now that's what they expect from men. And men are sort of fill, trying to fill that role. Right. Could be, Doc. I mean, could be, uh, man. Um, it could be. It would be lovely, you know, and we've got to do a better job of trying to get more women on the, uh, on the show to have these conversations with us. Um, you know, it, it could be that, that, that we may not see what love looks like, you know, um, from a physical perspective. Um, again, I go back, how often do we see, um, how often do we see loving physical relationships on TV uh, between people of color? Uh, very, very rarely. Um, I, I can't recall the, le you know, unless it's a predominantly Afri African-American cast in a movie, how often do we see that? You know, um, that how to make love, how to, you know, how to be the loving partner from a masculine perspective. I think we do see that dominant, uh, that, that dominance over women uh, from men of color. Um, and so as our young boys are growing up, what type of in, in, images are they seeing if they don't have anything else? And right. I think that's what we look to the role of good fathers and good mentors. Yeah, I believe in the media, we don't really see it at all. I mean, it's always some type of distorted character that is being portrayed in the movie. Either he's, um, you know, superhuman or he's psychotic. You know, it's right. all, you know, it's always that you know disparity between you know the two extremes that um, you know that we see. Um, I don't think that we get to see the Bill Cosby. Um, image enough as it relates to our families. Right, right. You know, Ahmed, Ahmed, that's a, Ahmed, let me just interrupt. That's a very interesting comment there because was there, here's a question, was there more, how can I say, more media coverage of Bill and his, how can I put it, his masculinity when he was doing his show or his masculinity when the alleged allegations came to him? Well, I think that uh, once those allegations came, that's when uh, he got the most coverage because it's always about uh, destroying the, uh, the image of the black male. That's, that's the purpose. 
and for someone, anyone to not be able to realize that they themselves are living in darkness, darkness, whether you're black, white, or Asian, to not see that the purpose is to destroy that image. That right here on this platform, there are three men that personify uh, greatness amongst black men. And we happen to find each other just in in casual uh, interaction. Uh, not that any one of us had to stand up on a particular platform with the sign saying that we're we're looking for positive black men. No, there are so many positive black men that are out here, but of course the media will focus on the minority mm -hmm. to say, look, this minority is actually the majority. Right, right, right. And I think we think about, uh, you know, Brother Cosby and his actions, you know, and, and going and filtering back to our topic, you know, sex, love, or domination. Um, it just seems quite interesting, uh, I guess, how do I say, how it's all played out, how, how this has all been played out in the media. Um, you know, the, 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 the contrarian perspective of, Cliff Huxtable to Bill Cosby, you know, and how, how that's played out, um, you know, and, and, and I think that goes to Cliff Huxtable being the family man, being the father that we wanted, we wanted to see. And then we see now Bill Cosby, sexual predator, you know, alleged sexual predator. Um, and so uh, I, it just has me you know, perplexed how do we, how do we, how does he allegedly get to that perspective? You're Bill Cosby. I mean, right. you know. Now, now, now he was exonerated, correct? No, no. He still has, he still has a, a number of cases now that have been brought against that he's in court, you know, uh, as a, uh, uh, as a defendant. Uh, one of the cases was dropped, but they are still, a number of cases that are still out there against him. Um, I don't know if you saw the documentary uh, that came out uh, with many of the women that he allegedly sexually assaulted talking about their experiences. Um, so just quite interesting, you know, and, and when we think of that hyper-masculinity in that sense, that's, that's not love, that's domination. That's, that is, uh, that is taking, something that's not yours. And I, you know, I, I have to stand up and say, you know, if, if those, if it's true, then that's problematic. Anyone who, uh, you know, and I've got my shirt on tonight that says consent is, you know, consent is sexy. Um, anyone who, who takes liberties with a woman without, without her consent, I, I can't support you, even though you may be a part of an organization that I'm a part of, sure, um, sure. you know, uh, I just can't. I, I, and I think we have to get at the fact is that what does love look like for us post, you know, this hyper masculine persona or what does it even look like for us, you know, as we're there in, in, in that hyper masculine attitude uh, as, or those behaviors and beliefs. I think that's the that's that's the crux of this conversation tonight. And, and just to touch on it, just a second. Um, I actually heard my uh, my wife, she goes and she does like all this research on these topics. I mean, she goes deep and she was investigating a lot of the allegations of those women that um, and she broke it down and she was like, this woman, this woman had accused these other people of the same exact thing. And, you know, and how like this woman had been on drugs for years and this woman had not even been in the vicinity of where she said she was. And so I don't, I don't know about um, the entire scope of that. I just know that when it comes to us, we are always portrayed as the King Kong, the, the, right. the big bad monster. Right. Now, uh, Doc and Ahmed, is that the, you know, as we've talked about this before, is that the, you know what I'm about to say, <laughs> you know, 
is is that the the uh, myth of the black penis when, when it comes into you know you know King Kong you think about uh, Buck the slave that was that that sired uh, that sired many of the slaves so the slave owner could have strong slaves and how that has then been passed down you know that perception of strong black men from a sec from a sexual prowess um, you know the theory of missus going down to the slave quarter. You know, to experience Buck, you know, um, to experience, the, you know, and when I say Buck, I mean the the the, yeah. the strong slave that was, uh, you know, uh, had had been used for these purposes. Um, the man. So is that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that whole Mandingo perspective, um, and do we try to continue to live up to that as well? You know, do we try to continue, you know, live up to that? that strong black, you know, prowess figure, you know, and, and how, how is that hampering who we are as men as well? You know, I want to be seen as strong and big and powerful in the bedroom, um, particularly when I don't feel strong and powerful uh, and big in the boardroom. So. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put in some thought process. I'm going to put in some thought process here i think it was a question with conversation piece that was in my mind is are many blacks believing or gone for the kool-aid for the media portrayal of themselves it's one thing for non-black society to buy in but is black society even buying into that also hmm Well, Kim, Kim asked, uh, uh, I, as I think about this, Kim asked a great question. I think that goes to it. How much of the big, strong feeling is the woman's responsibility in the bedroom? Um, you know, and so are, are we buying into the woman's perception of uh, of what we think that they want, right? Uh, you know, because uh, women will put out there what they want, you know, and we will try to live up to the perceptions and wants of our partners, uh, of the people who are in our lives, um, you know, and we want, let's just be, we, we want accolades. <laughs> you know, we, we want to feel like we're doing what we're doing. So we want, we want to be the, um, what's your boy's name the rent that runs the 100? Um, the, uh, we want to be the Lucy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. As Kim said, we want ovations, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, but you know, but you know, I do. I, I think really what it is is that, um, you know, I mean, in in that, as it relates to sexual prowess, I definitely don't want to be a disappointment, right? So, I mean, I. I think I cast off the the perception of being Mandingo many many years ago. Um, so, but I definitely don't want to be a, a disappointment. I think what I really am looking for is making sure that my frequency is tuned enough to match my wife's uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. That's a great way. That's a great way to say that. I mean, frequency. <laughs> I like it. I like that. <laughs> Tune into your wife's frequency. You know, yeah. um, there's an interesting thing to say that. I, I think that when you're in that hyper masculine persona, you're not worried about your your partner's freak, um, frequency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're worried about frequency. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting thing because I think that okay, you get doc, the Dr. Charles. Yeah, yes, Doc. I just I just wanted you to show your shirt again. I just wanted you to show your shirt again. <laughs> why why do you want me to show my shirt again, Doc? Okay. I just well, there's some people that have just joined the, the conversation, so I just wanted them to see it. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm not taking anything that's not given to me. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So I, I think that you know, 
that hyper masculine persona is thinking that I, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing to please the woman, but you know, every woman is different. You know, uh, being in the game for as long as I've been, you know, every woman is different. And if you don't have that understanding that every woman is different and that, you know, you may be mendigo to one and, you know, Hermit to the next. Hermit to the next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you get, yeah, exactly. You, you, you might be lost. So, right. yeah, that's a great way to say it. <laughs> Mandingo to one, Pee Wee Herman to the next. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. There you go. I just want to. I want to shout out Ebony, Kim, Shanae, Jean, and I know there's probably uh, two more people. I don't know who you are, but thanks everyone for coming into the conversation and love it. I love the numbers this evening. This has been one of our uh, more highly visited and engaged conversations. I wonder why. Everybody, but that's a whole other conversation. Like <laughs> that's what they like to talk about. Uh, you know? You got well, three scholars up here no talking about <laughs> There you go. And then and of course Ahmed Ahmed, you have to start a t shirt line about my I only I, I follow my wife's frequency. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Yes, yes. So, uh, so with with this about this subject and joking aside, and I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this, especially ladies. Why do you feel, or why do you feel men still have, for lack of a better blurred lines when it comes to love and domination? Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, so why do we have blurred lines and what? I lost you a little bit. Just saying, why do why do a number of men have, and it took us a long time, blurred lines when it comes to a line between love or domination? Uh, Kim, uh, Kim says, are you asking if men equate domination with love? No, some men do, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, why, are there, why, why might they be blurred lines? Um, because I think, and this is just anecdotal, and this is just my opinion, all right, it, is that we may not be shown um, – what what love is, and so I'm gonna give a a, a shout out to the the women, uh, because for a man to learn how to love truly, he has to be shown first by his mother how to love, and then there has to be a, a number of women. It can be one, but if there are a number of women to show him how to love, how to love a woman. You know, and how to love a woman with emotion and vulnerability uh, and sensuality and spirituality and sexuality. Um, if that doesn't occur, there may be some problems. And there also has to have the ability, and we go back to about this all the time, Doc, the ability to talk about what, what it looks like with your boys. Because we're also, we will subscribe to how to have sex early on by what our boys tell you. Yeah, dog, I smashed that. All right, you know what I'm saying? I'm about to hit that. I was going nine hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you think about all the all the terms that we use to, you know, uh, describe sex. They're very dominant words. You know, I crushed that. You know, I'm about to split that. Um, you know, how often you say, "Dog, I made love to my girl last night." Right. Yeah. You know, and so we don't. You know. We don't learn those the vocabulary that, that, that equates with loving your lady. Uh-oh, my sister Ladaya's in the house. <laughs> mm. uh. So I also think that um, the reason that lines could be blurred is uh, what you said, Dr. Charles, but also that um, instead of listening to our partners, we are acting off of, again, that persona of what is what we think it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, we want to leave our mark. So to say that 
as long as this woman shall live, she will never um, be with another sexually like she has been with me because I'm going to uh, tear it apart. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we we want to leave a mark somewhere. Right. You know? Leave Instead, them from wanting. Right. Exactly. You know, we like you said, we want to we want to crush, you know, we want to crush the cervix, you know. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is that perception that we have. And instead of listening and really being in tune and, and thinking of it from a euphoric state and a spiritual state that we're like, no, nah, we're we going to dominate. And it's almost like that's the button that a lot of men go to dominate right let me throw a little wrinkle in here for you though what if what if what if she wants to be dominated mm. gotta do what you gotta do <laughs> <laughs> and what is and what is that signal what you know what is that signal to you if that is the case and how do you you know you navigate that you know i guess that's uh, i i <laughs> I guess as Kim said, there's a place for domination and submission. Um, but I think that's tuning into your woman's frequency, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Understanding that. Yeah. Understanding that that may be her frequency. And that it may not happen all the time, but uh, you know, I think that's a good comment. That we ask what we really want, and if you know, but you have to have that communication and trust with each other. If you don't, if if you don't have that communication and trust, you know, it could, it could go, it can go awry. Yeah. Because I mean, if, if you are expecting someone to go into domination at this period of time, who's to say that the domination button ain't going to get stuck on. <laughs> right. Right. Right, you know? right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, and that can be problematic too. Um, where it, you know, you, you, you lose the button, <laughs> you, right? Yeah, you lose the easy button, and you stuck on, and then you then you lost. All right, yeah. uh, Kim Kim's off the hook right now, talking about safe words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, that's why I love my Kim. I love Kim, and I go way back. <laughs> Kim is hilarious. Kim is hilarious. All right, Doc, go ahead, bro. I know you've been waiting. <laughs> oh, I, I'm just, I'm just, just watch, watching everything flow out here. I just, just wanted to, wanted to mention here with, with this whole subject that I think the whole part of maybe why men are don't have the blurred is that the difference between friendship. You have to have a friendship before you have a relationship. True. Yeah, and I'm. And what and what does that you know? We have to again go back and say, well, what does that look like? What is friendship, you know? And how long should that last before someone becomes intimate? Um, some people may say, well, we've been friends for a day, or I like him, so that's my friend. And now let's move it into the nighttime. Let's do the bedroom, and it's only been a day. So, what does that really look like to most people? Well, it's a, that's a good question, and everyone has their own f definition of friendship. But I think first thing you got to be a friend to yourself first before you want to be a friend with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I definitely agree. Um, and is 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 that hypermasculine dude trying to be your friend, right? You know, what where is he a, along that friend friendship continuum? Not saying that you you can't be hypermasculine and not have friendships with women, but what's the correlation between hypermasculinity and intimacy and friendship? Is you know how does that look you know in, in a relationship? Um, you know, and, and then you get into that, that 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 idea is that is positive domination hypermasculinity. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and so with trust and love and communication and. Uh, you know, and 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 that that line between dominance and submission. Do you have to be hyper masculine to be that dominant person? You know. And and also too, I think a lot of women will to, to put me, out. The, go ahead, Doctor. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
I think that um, a lot of women will put out the stigma. Well, he's in the friend zone now, <laughs> you know, and they don't want someone that's in the friend zone. So, I mean, it gets confusing after a while. Like, where am I supposed to be? Am I supposed to be, you know, hyper masculine dominant or friend or what? Right, right, right. It's yeah. It, it it is an, an interesting foray into this and, and trying to understand, you know, that level of communication with women uh, and what they want. Kim asked a good question, you know, early on, how do women play into this creation of uh, hyper masculinity, um, you know, and, and, and saying that men are not just complicit, that they they may have some agitators to the development of hyper masculinity from women. And so um, there is that I don't want that weak dude. Um, you know, I want somebody who's going to protect me, uh, take care of me. We get into something. And so how all how does all that play out in perspective as well? You know, uh, I would think that you have to be able to navigate along that continuum for your partner. I just I just want to throw in here what effect, if any, does the home environment growing up have into this? Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, as Dr. Charles said earlier, I mean, it sets the stage. Uh, whether you have uh, a, you know a loving mother that's teaching you what love is about, whether you have a father that's showing balance um, and what um, masculinity really looks like. Um, even your siblings, you know, how are your siblings playing a role in your healthy development? Um, are they feeding you good messages of what it means uh, in your different stages of development? Or are you receiving negative messages? You know, uh, and negative messages could be um, stop crying, don't cry, be tough, be strong, um, you know, and those types of messages. Um, even when my son is playing sports, you know, he's a big guy, he's 15 years old, he's my size, like six foot one or two, and he's really um, dominating on the field. But we're not cheering, like some parents are like, crush him, kill him, you know, we're not cheering that. I mean, we're calling his name, but we're not advocating destructive, um, cliches at him um, that would inf influence his his mindset. Well said. Yeah, well said. I don't, I don't think I could any, add anything better to that. Well said. And then. Well, and I, I, and I just want to shout it again, everyone that's in the room this evening, a lot of great comments going on on the side. Love to if someone who's camera ready to join in, but if you're not camera ready, you can certainly uh, can certainly contribute with the comments on the side. Ahmed, uh, being a father of, of, I believe, two boys, how does this subject apply to you? What, if you've had the opportunity, have you shared about sex with your young sons at this time in their development and uh, defining right masculinity? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, I'm a father of five. Um, <laughs> I'm a okay. father of five, five uh, young men. Um, but we were just okay, having five. Uh, this conversation, um, uh, I think, yesterday. And, um, you know, I basically I always advocate for... Uh, safety first, uh, protection, what that looks like, um, and and at all costs, really, abstinence. Um, I had this conversation with my middle son today. Uh, he's about to be 17, abstinence, and what that looked like for me as a young father, uh, because I also have a 29-year-old. So as a 17-year-old, raising a kid 
that looked a certain way to me. And I was explaining to my son what that looked, how that looked and what that felt like. So to just share with him how afraid I was, how uneducated I was in the process, the shock that it, what it felt like to me, um, and just being honest with what I went through is one of the ways that I discuss and, and communicate sexuality and what it was like. You know, on one hand, as a young man participating, I was like hyper masculine, but that had its consequences, mm -hmm. you know, and it had lifelong consequences. Just let that rest. You want to drop it? You want to drop it like that, right there? <laughs> it has lifelong consequences. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know. It, so, so let ahead. me ask. Go I, I say, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go, Doctor Charles. No, no, no. You got it, Doc. You got it. You got it, Doc. So do you gentlemen feel that black fathers and black men are doing a better job of communicating the correct message when it comes to this subject? That's, that's a tough question, Doc. Um, I think we have these ideas of black masculinity um, and ideas of black male sexuality and how that is then, you know, um, transmitted to our sons, um, you know, and I would hope, I don't know, I'm not a father, you know, I haven't, I haven't been fortunate to have that conversation with my son. Um, I do know the conversation that was never had, you know, with my father, uh, but my father was 42 years older than me when I was born, you know, and so when I was 17, um, you know, when I was 17, he was 50, 63, right? So 60, 59, excuse me, he was 59. I think I can do the math. So it wasn't, you know, we, we were light years apart from each other. And so, uh, you know, this story, Doc, when he, he walked in, threw a box of condoms on the bed and said, you know, don't say dad never gave you anything. All right. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to hope that, that black fathers uh, and uh, black grandfathers, black uncles, men in general, are having conversations with young boys about what healthy sexual behavior is and what it looks like. But for them to be able to transmit that and communicate that, they have to have healthy sexual relationships themselves. And so um, that goes back to them if they haven't, you know, having a good, strong woman in their life to show them to, you know, you know, to kind of say, hey, sit them down. This is not what you think this is, you know, uh, and then to have the trust and vulnerability with them to learn. Um, the, women are critical to our success and development. If we don't think that and know that, we fail. We fail strongly because they are critical developmental markers and teachers in our life. Uh, and if you don't have strong women in your life to help you out, you're not going to succeed. You, you can't figure out their frequency, as, as my brother Ahmed said. <laughs> Ahmed, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, just one of the main things that I try to do is communicate my faults and weaknesses first to my sons. I try to show them all the all the areas where I went wrong. Now, I know that in contrast, they see me as hyper or hyper successful, if I could use that word. They see me as super successful in their eyesight. So what I try to do is to maintain a balance by also showing and communicating, well, these are my faults too. You know, I'm not, I'm not above making mistakes and I haven't been above making mistakes. And I got to this place by making a lot of mistakes. And it's my goal to try to show them, um, my mistakes so that they don't make the same mistakes mm -hmm. um, and that maybe I can help them avoid some of the pitfalls that I have encountered. 
but I, I try to always communicate um, the, the respect of women um, that my mother conveyed to me. Um, I teach them to uh, hold doors, be respectful, um, treat their mother with uh, divine respect. And, and I do the same. I live by my example. So um, that whether it's the right message or whether I'm delivering it correctly or not, I'm just doing the best that I can with what I know how to deliver. Uh, someone else may look at it and have a different take, but I'm just doing the best that I can. And, man, and, and that, that is all that you can ask for. You know, um, I mean, we're not perfect, as I said before, and we make mistakes. Um, you know, and uh, we make we make mistakes and uh, hopefully we learn from those mistakes. You know, I've been in situations where I have made mistakes, um, you know, and how I, how I have, you know, just comported myself in relationships um, with women. Uh, you know, as we know, this this show is a helpful journey for me and as I, you know, make this transition and, and learn how to love better, uh, how to be a better man. Uh, not only to the sisters in, in my life, but just women in general and to the brothers in my life. Um, but I have made mistakes. I've treated people poorly. Um, and for that, I apologize. But, we, you know, we, we make mistakes. Um, but fortunately, I think I, I continue to talk about the good women in my life. I've had some really, 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 really good women in my life. And I'm very, very thankful for their contributions <laughs> to my success as a man. Uh, you know, starting with my mother, who, you know, Doc, she celebrated 76 on Friday and I was mm -hmm. able to go home and see her. You know, that's always a blessing to, you know, to spend time with a woman who, you know, is the most beautiful, most passionate, most loving, you know, woman of your life. So I'm very, very thankful for my mother. Um, but we can't harp on our mistakes either. We must be able to learn from them. Um, you know, uh, I've tried to persuade and dominate and try to get things, you know, from women that were probably, you know, as, as I've gotten older, you know, I should have been more considerate. Right. I should have thought about them, you know, um, instead of just being a taker. And so I think now I try to, I try to give as much as possible, you know, and not be a taker. As, as we wind down on this conversation, <laughs> it's just come to my mind, what role of anything has the emasculation of men of color had on this subject in your, either one of your opinions? A huge role. Um, and, and I think it's part of the foundation of what we've gone through um, in, 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 the, in our history, what we've gone through feeling like that we aren't men um, by both our captors and then later through generations, the women that have been influenced by our captors, <clears throat> that we aren't men, that we are lazy, we're shiftless, we're clowns, uh, we're baby dads, you know, we're no good, we're dogs. All of those messages uh, play a huge role in how we see ourselves and, and um, how we also interact with the women that are in our lives. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, and I think that when you can't live up to the societal standards that have been set, you know, to be provider protector, uh, you know, to provide financial security for yourself and your family, um, to feel like what we label man, sex becomes the default to be dominant sexually. I, I can still be a man, you know, you know that 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 ground floor level of masculinity, uh, and so we we see that dominance, you know, and we go back to those descriptive words that we talked about earlier. That I can pound my chest, you know, that that's what I you know that's what I did today. I, I was a man, right, you know, and so that 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 is the consequences of that are are drastic when it comes to us and the people who love us. Uh, it can be very detrimental, uh, you know, and that may lead to, as we see, domestic violence, uh, sexual abuse, sexual assault, 
um, things like that because you need to exhibit your masculinity because you have been emasculated. And that's tough for that's tough because you know, Ahmed, you know, um, we are emasculated. It doesn't matter what station of life, you know, you look at President Barack Obama being emasculated, you know, being president. It doesn't matter what station you are, there, there are levels of emas- people who are trying to emasculate and take take that power away from you. It's wow. how you handle that situation. Exactly. And LaDonia said, um, you know, <clears throat> when you see that emasculation, emasculation, then men will try to overcompensate. And that's why you have a lot of what they call black on black crime, you know, like that's where it comes from, that we've been beat down in so many areas. That we're trying to claw our way back to some type of uh, sensibility. <clears throat> and I heard uh, Dick Gregory say one time that uh, when the Jews were coming out of slavery, that the, the 9,000 years or whatever that they had been trying to come out of slavery, that they were doing the same exact thing. They had the same exact behavior of crime on each other, killing on each other, you know, substance abuses and things of that nature. And that it's only natural for somebody coming out of such a an oppressed state to go through these phases. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that you've hit right on the head, uh, Ahmed. We, we see that domination, that hypermasculine in the dominance and aggression with the violence uh, within our communities. Um, that you know, it's, it's almost like um, what was that TV show back in the day? Um, he would always say there can only there can be only one. Uh um, oh, Highlander. The Highlander. Yeah. <laughs> the Highlander. And so it, we've almost got to that perspective that there can be only one. There can be only one block. There could be there can be only one Marlowe for my, my wire fans. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you love to hate Marlo. I hated Marlo. I mean so I not. <laughs> literally hated Marlo, but Marlo was the epitome of hypermasculinity. But if you remember you know, as as the show progressed in the last season, Marla was trying to get out. Marla was, right. I want to be a businessman. I want to, right. this, whole, uh, this whole persona, you know, is what it was. But he played it, man. You, he, you, were, you were hoping that Omar got him. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, because you were like, dude, I'm trying, I'm trying to come to this TV and come get you myself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, Doc, I'm yeah. looking at the comments here, and Kim is saying that that uh, Micro had a serious done a serious blame on black men and black women. Yeah, no, I I, I totally agree with Gene and and Kim. Uh, gotta give a shout out to my line brother Gene Jones, good man of Omega Sci Fi. Thank you mm. for coming on the show tonight. Uh, brother Gene, respect. Yeah. yeah so. Um, yeah, but you're right, and I, I think about in the post, you know, as we close this out, we think about it in the post Barack Obama uh, entering into the Trump era, the the rise. What would be the rise in microaggressions? You know, and I, you know, and since Tuesday, I haven't taken anything off of anybody. <laughs> if you don't say excuse me, excuse me is the word that you need to say. You know, mm. you're gonna wait for me to get my bag off this plane. You're not gonna walk by me. Mm. <laughs> We're not gonna have that just because you feel like your boy has given you <laughs> credence, you know, to do what the hell you want to do. Nah, that's just not gonna happen. Wow. Okay. Well, I know it's coming to the top of the hour, and uh, and there's Kim. Yes, black man. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, I'm gonna be home. So, um, um, what we'll do is it's come to. The- <laughs> There you go. Well, you, no problem with that. So uh, as we come to the uh, close of another conversation, because it's coming to the top of the hour, and we know that uh, Dr. Charles, he's gone at the top of the hour. Any last comments you'd like to make, Dr. Charles? Just <laughs> uh, a great show. It's always, you know, sex always brings people out. Uh, good commentary. Always a pleasure to be with you and Ahmed, um, you know, just to talk through these things. Your brothers are, you know, family. And we've been on the show together so long now. It's family. And just to appreciate everybody, uh, Kim, LaDiana, Gene, uh, Ebony, um, 
Shane for you know just being a part of the show uh, and you know continue to check us out. Uh, we'll continue we'll continue on with these conversations. Your input is always going to continue to drive the show. So we appreciate you. You can always check me out on Twitter, Instagram at WY Revolution, or check out my company's website at wyrevolution.com. And Ahmed, any closing words? Yeah, definitely. This is this is such a uh, enlightening conversation that we have, um, and I think that we need it more. I think more more of these types of conversations, especially around sex, masculinity, femininity, how we interact and relate with one another, we need to talk about this more so that we can start to define clear roles and and give clear definitions as to. Um, what means what, when does no means uh, mean no, and when does no mean yes, and you know things of that nature. We need to have this conversation more so that uh, we can progress and, and be fruitful. So, uh, and not necessarily fruitful on having kids, but uh, even that too, yeah, populate. Let's make more babies. We need more, uh, more children. So, uh, uh, you can find me on pretty much any social media platform at Ahmed Hazel, as well as uh, you can reach me at premiercapitalinvestmentfund.com. Excellent. Gentlemen, fantastic job. As usual on the conversation, I want to give a shout out to LaDonia, Jean, Kim, Ebony. Kim, I see Kim already. Everyone who stopped by live or who will catch us on the replay, much appreciated and not taken for granted. Uh, if you want to touch base with me, probably the best place to go, I'm just going to give the website address in the comment section. DrVibeShow.com. I, I am award-winning Dr. Vibe Show. It's the place for Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations. Also, my Twitter handle is there also. And you can catch the replay of this probably in the next few days on the website. If you have any questions, comments, direct them to me at the email. I'm giving you the email address. And I, the other gentleman may put their email addresses. I don't know, but I put mine here. And if you have any conversations that you'd like to have hosted by myself, contact me. Probably 99% of the time, I'll have them on the conversation. Dr. Charles, are you back again next week or in a two weeks' time? Two weeks time, Doc. Let me let me let me let me see where I am. Let me look at the calendar, Doc. Let me let me, let me, let me see where I am. Let me calendar. Okay. I just want to make everyone aware we'll be back tentatively in two weeks time. So for those who are looking for next week, it's not going to happen. Two weeks time. As always, I like to say you're blessed and highly favored. You're a magnet for miracles and your solution for someone's problem. Thanks everyone watching live on the replay. You will make a change if you too. God bless, peace, do well, keep the faith, and remember, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Good night. God. What's up, everybody? My name is Chris Jones. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and the first person I want to see when I got to Toronto was Dr. Vibe. Been on his show before. I will be on his show again if he lets me. He's a great guy. I tell everyone to tune in, to download, to subscribe. You're going to learn some things. It's good for your mind. It's good for your heart. It's good for your body. It's good for your spirit. On and off the mic, he's a great guy. You got to check him out. My name's Chris Jones, all of from Chicago. Peace and love.